Hello everyone, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to CS300 at Portland State University, our software engineering introductory course. Like I say, I'm Bart, I'll be your instructor for this adventure. I have a reasonable amount of industry experience and have practiced building software in the real world. I'm also an academic who is to some extent concentrated on software engineering and have a lot of experience teaching people software engineering and helping them become better software developers. So hopefully that'll be useful to you. I hope you're all staying safe and well in this difficult time. I know there's a lot of tough stuff going on out there and you have my unfeigned sympathy um, for whatever situation you're in. I hope that you're staying safe and well. Having said that, I think it's probably worth just diving in and starting out by talking about a little bit about the foundations of software engineering and that'll give us some hint of what we're doing in our study of software engineering and hopefully will give you some orientation and background about what's going on. So if you're good with that, let's go ahead and get started. So this course has a couple purposes. One of them is to make you a better programmer. We have found that for various reasons, people who've spent a couple years just learning the discipline of a programming language and how to write programs are not ready to do a lot of the things that software developers need to do. We would need to work on that. And related to that, we need to prepare you for industry. I know that many of you are excited to be doing the industry thing soon and to get out there in the real world and have a high paying job. And who can blame you? That's an absolutely noble goal. A couple other things that are peculiar to Portland State and to academia in general. First of all, we have this capstone course that most of you will be taking fairly soon, which is a larger scale two-term course where you build a software project. And we're really trying to prepare you to be a valuable participant in that larger scale process. So this is sort of the baby steps version of that. And even for those of you who are going on to grad school, um, and really don't have any interest in the industry thing, and I know there aren't very many of you out there, but there may be a few. Let me reassure you that in my extensive career in academia, I've used software engineering and software development skills a lot. It's been a thing that's helped pay my way through school, but it's also been a, you know, by working on campus, but it's also been a thing that's helped me a lot in my research. And I think you'll find that the kinds of things you learn as you start to pick up software engineering and software development are things that will apply to you even if you stay safely hidden in the ivory tower like I have to some degree. So that's the motivations. And the second thing that some of you may be thinking is, well, this whole course is a silly waste of my time because programming isn't that hard. I've been programming in academia for a couple of years and maybe I've been programming before that and alongside that in you know, sort of the private world and just computer programs, it's really not that bad. Uh, and to some extent, for some of you who are absolutely skilled and put in the time and effort and attention, yeah, sure, actually learning how to write a program is not that big a deal. And I can well believe that you've done a good job of that. The thing is, the problems you'll run into as you move out of sort of toy settings and into realistic settings are sort of bigger and harder and figuring stuff out gets harder. There's a lot more to figure out and it's a lot harder to do when you sort of throw away the constraints and shackles of programming in the small and a controlled environment, things get tricky. And so I think there's stuff to learn there and I'm gonna to try to help you learn that this quarter. The other thing is software is people. I can't emphasize that enough. Software is written by people, for people to use, under the direction of people. And because of people involved in every stage, that is some of the beauty of this discipline, but it's also some of what makes it quite difficult. And a lot of what we'll be talking about over the next bunch of lectures is sort of how do I deal with people? How do I make that part work? Because that's a key skill and it's, I think most people in industry would agree with me when I say it's more important in a lot of ways, the people skills and the skills of managing 
how people interact with software are more important than the pure technical skills. Pure technical skills are easy for people to come by, it's relatively speaking. People-related skills are much, much harder. And, you know, everything I've said so far and a lot of what we'll say over the course of the next 10 weeks is about engineering and software engineering isn't really special in a lot of ways. All engineering essentially is the same four step process repeated in whatever kind of engineering you're doing. You ask, what are you gonna build? And that's, what are the requirements? What does this thing I wanna build need to do? And that turns out to be a harder question than it sounds. You ask, how are you gonna build it? That's the design stage. What you know? Okay, I know what I need to what I need the thing to do. How am I going to make it do that? And then I do it finally. That has to happen. And then, did I do it right? You know, validation and verification, checking whether the thing I built meets my requirements, and also checking whether it meets the needs of whatever it's supposed to do. Maybe I screwed up the requirements somewhere. And. That's true whether you're building a car or a rocket or a biotech thing or software. All of those things do that. One of the things that's important to emphasize here in good old CS300 world is that typically as a gross rule of thumb for software, and this is true for every kind of engineering discipline, but software is a good example, we usually say as a rule of thumb, requirements and design, figuring out what I need to build and how I'm gonna build it, are typically 60% of the development effort, sort of very roughly. And that validation and verification thing are typically another 20%, and that leaves 20% for the actual programming. So when we give you in a CS 100 or 200 class a homework assignment, we've already done the requirements for you. We've essentially already specified the design, we will check it for you at the end to see if it's been done right. So to some extent, you're doing something like a fourth or a fifth of a job of the job when you write that program. And what we're gonna concentrate on this class to some large extent is the other four fifths, the parts that we haven't given you much instruction on or practice with. Another thing about engineering is it's always interdisciplinary. We're never building software. And that sounds silly, but you know, neither is a mechanical engineer building mechanical systems. Well, they are, and we're building software, but it's in the context of some larger system that does a thing. A computer locked in a room, in a box, you know, without any access to the outside world, running some computation is pointless, and you can write whatever software you want because it doesn't matter. Software is only useful in as much as you put it in things, in put it in places where it can be useful. And so we really need to get some grasp of not just how software works, but how computers work, and not just how computers work, but how systems containing computers work. We're gonna end up learning some domain knowledge and stuff every time we do a project. And that's a thing that's true for any kind of engineering, absolutely. Another thing about engineering that is that it's two-tiered, There's it's two levels. At the bottom level, we have some project, and the project is to actually build a thing that we wanna build. And you know, we go through these four things. What are we gonna build? How are we gonna build it? We build it and we check it. But sort of there's a level above that that's the management level. And in the management level, we sort of do the same thing about the project itself. We say, well, how are we gonna run this project? You know, what, you know, what is the project, how does the project need to do work? You know, what results does it need to produce? How are we gonna produce that result? So we've done requirements and design for the project itself. We run the project and then at the end, we make sure that the process, and so we call this the project level and the process level. And a lot of software engineering and any kind of engineering is about the process level. How do I ensure I get a good result by managing the process by which the project operates? And this book that we're using in this course takes a sort of interesting view of the project level in that they sort of replace that with a product level where instead of, you know, doing, building, concentrating on the project, on 
producing an artifact, a custom artifact as part of a project. We concentrate on building a custom artifact as part of product development, but really it's the same thing at the end of the day. Finally, engineering is about risk and risk management. In a world where nothing ever went wrong, nothing ever could go wrong, people could not make mistakes, things could not fail, it would be a much simpler place and engineering would be much, much easier. In any kind of engineering, we think about what's the likelihood? Well, you know, how likely is it that something will go wrong? And if it does go wrong, how bad will it be? What are the consequences when something goes wrong? And that's great thinking about one thing that could go wrong in isolation, but of course, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And so the third question is sort of how do these risks interact? What if two things go wrong or three? If you study accidents, very famously, people who study risks and risk management point out that most big disasters aren't from a single cause. It's a whole bunch of risks that, hap that came to be failures all at the same time. And so we really spend a lot of our time as engineers, any kind of engineers, software engineers, you know, chemical engineers, obviously mechanical engineers, thinking about failure and risk. So that's sort of what we're doing. We're doing engineering. We're in the Messy College of Engineering and Computer Science, and we're doing sort of engineering and computer science. And it's an interesting question that many of us on the faculty have argued about how much mm -hmm. the computer science as a whole discipline is anything other than a bunch of software engineering. And I would argue that it is more than that, but it's certainly a big part of it. But the other thing to point out is that software engineering is in some ways the weirdest engineering. Of all the engineering departments in the Messy College of Engineering and Computer Science, the computer science, the software engineering engineers have the weirdest situation, I think. First of all, we build the most complicated things, probably. The chip designers, you know, the CPU designers might have an argument with us, but these days CPU design is arguably software anyway. And certainly outside of digital design and software design, you know, we don't build anything else, not just this complicated, but even close, even vaguely close. You know, the, the U.S. highway system, if you take the whole thing as a single big project, which it obviously sort of isn't, the pieces are isolatable, it's still not very complicated compared to a modern large piece of software or computer chip or whatever. So we're building complicated, complicated things. And you know, when we build other complicated things these days, they're complicated, they're able to be complicated because we have software to manage the complexity. So we move the complexity of building fancy factories or the complexity of building, you know, organizational systems, government bureaus and that kind of stuff. We move it over onto computers and software and that's how we manage the complexity. So it's kind of us keeping that all working. The second weird thing is that, you know, bits are a very different thing than atoms. We have the only kind of engineering in the Messy College where our product is literally perfectly replicable as many times as you want and distributable essentially instantly at zero cost. If you've built one of a piece of software, you've built all the, you can build as many more as you want instantly for free and pass them out for free. Um, that's crazy. There's nothing like that. Imagine if mechanical engineering was like that. I had a colleague as an undergraduate who was doing organic chemistry. She spent, I don't know, almost a year building three cc's of liquid in the bottom of a test tube that was some kind of magic organic chemistry liquid and then accidentally dropped the test tube. It only took her four months a second time. You know, my dad really wanted me to be a general surgeon or to be a doctor anyway, he was a general surgeon. And I always, one of the jokes I always made was, well, yeah, if you had backup patients, you know, we're in a weird world where we're dealing with these bits that are just crazy structures compared to anything else we work with. And even more than in other kinds of engineering, you know, there just is no software only system. You can look at some kinds of mechanical systems and say, well, yeah, that's mostly mechanical. You know, you can look at some kind of uh, 
chemical system and say, well, that's mostly chemistry. You know, every software system needs at least a computer to run on. And most of them need, well, they all need some kind of peripheral, some kind of way of doing input and output from that computer they're running on, screens and keyboards or networks or whatever. And most of them need more stuff than that. They're interacting with some complicated thing out in the world. They aren't much by themselves. So, you know, this is a weird kind. The other challenge of software engineering that you need to take into account is that this is a new discipline compared to almost any kind of engineering. Maybe, you know, there's some kind of, maybe you could count quantum computing. Maybe you could count some kinds of bioengineering as newer than software engineering. But it's still a 50-year-old discipline, probably, really, 50, 60. And it really was the 1980s before, you know, software engineering started being done on a grand scale all over the place. And while the pace of change is slowing today, while we don't have as much change every year as we used to, it's still, if you, if you play Rip Van Winkle and go to sleep in software engineering and wake up 10 years later, you're gonna find a very different world 10 years later than you went to sleep in. And so that's, that's a thing too, you know, mechanical engineering, uh, chemical engineering, you know, whatever, build on long foundations. We don't have so much long foundations. And a lot of the big changes, of course, in these other disciplines have been uh, changes because computers have changed so fast because we're using computers more and more places in other kinds of engineering. Finally, Compared to other kinds of engineering, we are worse. We are more failure prone you know, historically. And there again, it's improving slowly over time. It's not as bad as when I was a kid, but we still have this problem and this reputation for a problem of building systems that are not reliable, don't work well, are not secure. And so that's a thing we have to worry about. So that's software engineering. There's a nice overview of what we're doing and hopefully it's been useful to you. And the kinds of issues I just raised are the kind of issues we're gonna tackle. So, you know, what does this all mean? How does this apply to you? Well, if all went well at this point, you know how to program at this point, that's great. You should be very proud of that. I am 100% serious and not at all sarcastic when I say that's a big challenge and good for you in getting there but you still have a lot you need to learn and this course is going to start you down some of those you need to learn how to take a problem end to end that is from a customer has a need to i've built software that meets that customer's need i need to teach you how to work with process you need to learn how to work with process you need to learn how to work with people you need to learn how to manage complexity you need to learn how to manage risk you need to learn how to manage rapid change we have 10 weeks. There's, you know, a lot of you in this class. There's only so much I can tell you, partly because of those constraints and partly because, frankly, there's only so much we know. Um, there's a lot that we still don't know about the best ways to build software. It is a young discipline. It is a complicated discipline, and we're still figuring it out. And even if we, for some royal we, knew a lot, I only know so much. I'm a humble practitioner in this field, I can teach you what I know, but that isn't going to be everything everybody knows. And a lot of what I know and a lot of what we know isn't written down very well anywhere. We really lack a lot. What we have these days is piles of blogs and YouTube videos and self-help books and stuff on software engineering that frankly the noise content is fairly high and the quality tends to be fairly low. So while there's a lot written down these days, there's not a lot that's well written down. There's a lot missing from that account. So part of my job as the instructor is to give you some of that. And that, folks, is what I have for you for now. I hope it's useful. We'll talk again shortly about things with building products and how software looks and some of the management stuff is where we're gonna start out because it's where our course textbook starts out. In the meantime, I hope you're staying safe and well out there, and I really look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for listening. <laughs>